Today in, in Hebrews, this, the, the, the topic is dull hearing and a harsh warning. And it's interesting because the idea of dull hearing in Hebrews is not like, is, is not like some guy's got hearing problems. It's more like the person that's got their fingers stuck in their ears saying like, God, I can't hear you. And when you think about it that way, when we're saying, God, I can't hear you, but my own hands are the ones covering my ears, it's not a God problem, right? It's a me problem. And so as we come to this passage in Hebrews chapter 5 and even extending into the first half of chapter 6, a um, very difficult passage today. Not entirely because the text that we cover is so difficult, but partly because the, the, the writer of the passage, he rebukes harshly the Hebrews for their lack of maturity. And I'll tell you, when, when as a pastor you come to a passage like this, it's always tough because uh, I, I don't want anyone to sit out there and think, oh, Pastor Steve's trying to rebuke me. I, I'm not. But I'm going to honestly preach the Word of God. And what that means is that as we talk about the rebuke that the writer of Hebrews has for his audience, I, I know that the same rebuke applies to some of us. And when we honestly evaluate our own lives, what we find is, much like the Hebrews, that some of us have been hearing dully, like we've stopped up our ears. And so we deserve this harsh warning as much as they do. Right? We, we want to we want to train hard and run the race with endurance so that we stand before God one, one day, right? And, and, say, and hear the Lord say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Amen? Amen. The, the problem is that when we're immature in our faith, we don't hear that. We hear something else. Check this out. I, I, uh, I like numbers and Lifeway had this fantastic tagline that said, we're fond of the Bible, we just don't do what it says or something like that, right? We, we like the Bible, we just don't read it statistics say, or believe it, statistics say, one in five Americans has read the Bible. That's the chart that you see up there. One in five has read the Bible one or more times in its entirety, right? So in a country where we say 80% of us, we believe Jesus died on the cross for me. I just don't care what he said. You forget about the country. Let's move over to Christians. Only 17%, get this, 17% of Christians have a biblical worldview. What? <laughs> do, do you understand what, what the research would say is that, that in America, where most people say they're Christians, and when you only look at the Christians, the people that say they're Christians, 83% don't agree with what God says is true. Maybe we should go back and say, Dull hearing leads to a harsh warning, <laughs> right? If not for the church, for the global church in America. The, the uh, definition, by the way, the way they define Christian worldview is they say believing that absolute moral truth exists, the Bible is accurate, that Satan is real, um, that, that uh, a person cannot earn their way to heaven by being good or doing good works, that Jesus lived a sinless life, that God is all-knowing, all all-powerful, all and still rules the, the universe today. Not even a, 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 a difficult definition of biblical worldview, but even at that, right, most of American Christians do not agree with what God says about God. Why, why is this a problem? Well, if you look in Hebrews, there's a couple of things that should really get us. We looked in the first three chapters, what we saw is that the superiority of Jesus Christ motivates our absolute devotion to Jesus. Why should we believe what Jesus Christ says in his word? Why should we believe God and follow him with all that we are? Because Jesus is the extra most bestest. Amen? Can you imagine, right, you're writing the letter to the Hebrews, and you spend three chapters saying, man, Jesus is higher, he's greater, he's the absolute perfect representation of God with us. He's the final, the pinnacle, the absolute revelation of God that gave himself for us. And the writer of Hebrews were like, well, I understand that Jesus is better, but I want to do what I want to do anyway. I'd submit to you this morning that even amongst the American church, as we look at the statistics, that we might find a bunch of Christians who say, you know, I know that Jesus is better, that he's superior, that he's the extra most bestest, but 
I kind of want to do things my own way. Not only that, we saw in chapter 4 as we continued that there's this transition in Hebrews, right? The first section of Hebrews is all about Jesus is the extra most bestest. And we could glorify Jesus and spend all day looking at the names and the beauty and the majesty of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? But he's not just superior. He's the Lord Jesus Christ that came down to earth and experienced humanity with us. And so we find that we have the great high priest in chapter 4. The great high priest who, because he experienced flesh, he's not distant away from us, but he, he can relate to us. He can be there for us and sympathize with us in our time of need. So again, we live in a society where 83% of Christians say, I, I like the Bible. I love Jesus. I'm just not sure I want to do what he says. <laughs> And you know, when we look at the priesthood of Jesus Christ, he's there to help us run the race. Jesus Christ is there to be with you or for you in your absolute time of need. And when we refuse that, we deserve the harshest rebuke. This is the way the text plays out today that we're going to look at. The problem, failure to mature. A failure to mature. The writer of Hebrews writes and he says, look, you've got the best Christ, the best God, the perfect, absolute creator that has given everything for you. He's a perfect, great high priest that knows what you're going through. Trust him, follow him, do what he says. And he gets to chapter 5 and he says, you, you're not listening. You're not listening. And as we continue in chapter 6, he says, because you've not listened, if you continue in this way, there's a great price that must be paid. And at the end, I want you to understand that even in the midst of confirmation, uh, of confrontation, even in the midst of confrontation, hope remains. Here's the deal this morning, church. I don't know where you are. I said it's a hard passage to preach because of, uh, uh, of, of my general knowledge of the way the Christian community behaves, right? I, I understand that statistically somebody in this room is not living the life that they know they ought to live for Jesus Christ. I know that there's been times in my life where I've not lived the life that I know that I needed to live for Jesus Christ. And so this morning, as we talk about the harsh rebuke and the confrontation, I want you to understand at the end of the text, the writer of Hebrews, he's like, look, I get it that you've messed up, but I am confident that our great God has a wonderful purpose for your life. This morning, as much as I want you to seriously evaluate yourself, I want you to leave here today thinking, Jesus Christ has me. And because he has me, he will persevere me. And because he will persevere me, tomorrow I will not be the same guy that I was yesterday or the day before or even the same person that I am today. And that should bring us hope. Here's our, our, our first passage we're going to look at beginning in verse 11 of chapter 5 in, in, in the book of Hebrews. The, the word reads like this, about this. We have much to say. He's talking about the priesthood of Jesus Christ that he just talked about. About this, about the priesthood of Jesus Christ, we have much to say and it's hard to explain. Why? Because you've become dull of hearing. <laughs> Verse 12, for though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you, listen to this, again, the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. Because everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness because he is a child. But solid food is for the mature. For those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. And then just continue a few more verses, not, not on the screen. Therefore, he says, let us leave the elementary doctrines of Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and faith towards God and instructions about washings or baptisms, the laying on the hand, of the hands, the resurrection of the dead, the eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. Check out the passage. Isn't this extraordinary the way the writer of Hebrews begins and he starts to, to look at these, 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 these Christians and he says, you've become dull of hearing. You ought to be teachers, but you need a teacher. 
You ought to be doing great things for God and, and, and eating solid food and growing in your faith. But you're not. You have become dull of hearing. To the, first, the, the conf confrontation. You have become dull of hearing. The, the perfect tense in the, the passage here indicates they used to be in better spiritual condition. The, the, the sense of the writer of Hebrews is something to the effect of, you guys used to be on fire for Jesus Christ. Right, as he writes to him, he's like, Hebrews, you were, man, you were just going gangbusters for the Lord. It was amazing to watch what God was doing. But as of late, the fire's kind of been snuffed out. Man, I don't know what's going on. You've become dull of, of hearing. You, you, you've, you've suppressed the glory of God that was coming out through you. Instead of shining your light, you've hidden it under a bush. What, what's going on, man? Come on. Serious confrontation that the, the writer of Hebrews starts to talk to him. He, he's, he's trying to get the idea here that we need to clean out our ears. Right, unstop our ears. We need to return to what we've done. Why? And the, the, the dull hearing, right? The, the, the dull hearing in, in, in chapter 5 and verse 11, the dull hearing leads to this, this childish behavior. Now, man babies make bad believers. <laughs> Woman babies make bad believers. But let me just say for just a minute, man up! <laughs> right, like, Guys, come on. It's Memorial Day, and I, I thank the veterans. I thank, I thank those, those who have fallen. You, you all know, most of you, I, my first career, I was a defense contractor, worked with military, and um, I, I can remember the, the, the pride and the, the, the glory of the man who would say, I will go out and do anything for my country. Sissy's not allowed, Right? Today in the church of God, of Jesus Christ, sometimes instead of having this pride and this glory of I will do anything it takes to grow in my faith and serve the Lord Jesus Christ, it's like a bunch of sissies, not, not you guys, somebody else, <laughs> right? Man babies make bad believers. And look at the way the text plays out in verses 12, 13, and 14. He just lays it out for me. He's like, you ought to be teachers, but you need somebody to teach you. Let me say, just uh, as word of explanation, the, the word teacher here is not, not what I'm doing. He's not saying you guys should be teaching Bible studies or that you guys should necessarily be preaching from the pulpit. He, he's, he's talking about the idea of that you, older in the faith, should be training those younger in the faith. It's discipleship. This is why we focus on like D groups and, 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 and small groups and um, facilitating. And the, the, the idea is that as a believer grows in the faith, you, mature Christian, should be training a less mature Christian to become a more mature Christian, that they might train a less mature Christian. You see, the, the process continues. Because here's the deal if everybody in this room says, you know what I'm going to do to grow in my faith is I'm just going to send people to listen to Pastor Steve on Sunday morning, tank going to work. One guy, he used an illustration of preaching. He said, uh, Bible study is kind of like this. He said, um, Sunday morning preaching, it's like everybody has a cup and the pastor's throwing out buckets of water and you're trying to catch some in your cup. And he said, but in a one-on-one -on -one discipleship, it's more like you're holding out your cup and the guy has a pitcher and he's pouring it in there. The, the idea of scripture when it says they should be teachers, he's saying that you, you should be at a point in your faith where you can impart in somebody else what Christ has imparted in you. Listen, friend, you don't have to be perfect. Don't think that you have to have like 3,500 scriptures memorized before you can sow into somebody else. More of you are able to teach or disciple somebody than you know. You can do it even if you don't think you can. The idea or the lie from the devil is that you're not ready to tell somebody else about Jesus. It's a bunch of malarkey. If you've got the Spirit of God in you, You've got the Bible beside you. And you've got others who can come along and help you sow into somebody else less mature than you. All of us should be able to get to the point where we can be a teacher instead. What's he say? Instead of teaching, you need somebody else to teach you. Uh, you need to relearn the basics. 
He says, somebody needs to teach you the, the operative word, again. Somebody else to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. Years ago, I was listening to a sermon by a guy. This is before I was a preacher. It still sticks with me. He was talking about the Corinthians. Paul uses the same spiritual food analogy to the Corinthians. And, and this preacher, he said, uh, bold, right? Brass almost. And he says to his congregation, um, or about the congregation, I guess. He said, I ought to be serving steak Sunday morning, but instead I feel like I'm suckling a whole room full. Th this is what the writer of Hebrews is saying. Listen, I'm not saying that to you. I believe we have some mature believers in here that are doing right. But as the writer of Hebrews speaks to him, he's, he's like, we should be feasting on these great theological truths of God. Instead, we're passing the bottle around. Baby bottle. They, uh, they left the word. He said, for everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness because he's a child. You see, the, the idea is that they, they, uh, they left the, the word of God for something else. Um, they, they, they forgot to focus on what God's word was teaching. Let me, um, let me give you a warning this morning. Christian book advisory. I, I love Christian books, and I think it's such a, a value to all of us. But, but understand this morning that every Christian book should come with some kind of label that says something to the effect of contents may not represent the thoughts or intentions of God. In other words, as much as we should be able to earn or learn from these, these books and these texts and these articles and the internet and all this other stuff, if we've neglected the word of righteousness in favor of other stuff, we've missed out on God's meat for us. So what do we do? Let me just uh, give you a, a few things. What's, what's the next steps? Well, 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 a couple things. Verse 14 and, and 6, 1 through 3 give us some proactively ways to change. We constantly practice to distinguish good from evil. Two words. Train hard. Train hard that we can get in good spiritual shape. But last night my son and I were talking and we were uh, talking about getting in shape. And he had a buddy that, that wanted to work out with him and this guy hadn't worked out in years and um, Donald's in pretty good shape. He works out five or six times a week. And so his buddy, who's not been in shape in, you know, like years, he's like, I, mean, I could go, I could keep up with you. And the dude puked, <laughs> popped, quick, right? That to become mature, spiritually, physically fit, spiritually fit, not one and done. Because if you think, right, if I sit here and I'm like, oh, I read the Bible 30 years ago, I'm set for life. I'm going to get in a battle and I'm going to pop. Right? Because I'm not spiritually fit. What does the word say in verse 14? This is almost a quote. Constantly practice to distinguish good from evil. It's this repetitive um, going back to the word of God, the study, this learning, the small group, the D group, the, the Bible study. Why do we make church a priority? Because we want to constantly practice to distinguish good from evil. And he goes on in verses 1 through 3 of chapter 6. He says, and leave behind the elementary doctrines. They're, they're foundational. Listen. You're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. You, you should cherish and hold on to the basic things of the faith. But we need to mature. Right? When we're, when we're saved, we're a student of the faith. But as we mature, we should become teachers of the faith. When we, when we, when we receive Christ, we are discipled. But at some point, we should make that transition and begin to disciple somebody else. When we receive Christ, somebody is evangelizing us. But we should reach a point in our life where we're evangelizing somebody else. This brings us to the, the, the next half of the slide, the other, the other half. Evaluate yourself. Well, as we look back to this first section, this uh, 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 confrontation. By the way, none of us like confrontation, but we all need it. And, and part of the reason God gives us a, a body of believers, a church, is so that we can confront one another when we're, when we're not up to snuff. Right, all of Matthew chapter 18 about rebuking a brother who's in sin is for the purpose of, get this, that you might gain a brother. Right, it's all about reconciliation. And the reason that the writer of Hebrews is confronting the Hebrews that he writes to, right, is he's, he's saying, I, I want you to be better than you currently are. Like, I see the good in your life and I, I can see that you can be amazing for Jesus, but, but there's this thing in front of you. 
And so this morning, let me, let me just ask you just a few words, right? Immaturity. Think about your life and ask yourself, where is my faith lacking? Where am I spiritually immature? What, what, what have I, I forgotten or what do I need to go back to? It? Maybe the next question, where, where do I need to begin to grow? Or even positively in your life, just compare, this is where I'm immature, this is where I'm mature, where I'm growing. God, help me move these immature places to these mature places. Not, not arrogantly, right? If, myself included. If any of us is sitting out here thinking, well, my immature list is pretty short, <laughs> write pride down <laughs> and start with pride and then go from there. All of us have places we need to grow and, and we can, can move them from less mature to more mature and, and they never are completely mature, but we keep on going. The, the third thing, excuses. What are my faith excuses? Ooh, better, what are my lack of faith excuses? You know, we all have excuses and they're like armpits and something else and they all stink. And, and we're sitting there thinking, well, I, I would be a teacher except that there's this one time where this thing happened to me and I just can't do it. If my life was like his life or her life, then I would be more mature. It's daddy's fault. Mom's fault. Brother's fault. Sister's fault. Dad, husband's fault. Wife's fault. It's somebody's fault that I'm not where I need to be in Christ. It's just not my fault. Move that pride back to the maturity list, right? What are the excuses that I'm making that are keeping me from maturing in Jesus Christ? Again, self-evaluation. And then ask yourself, have I forgotten the basics? That I need to be relearning the basics? Have I forgotten the basics of the faith so much that I need to be retaught before I can move on to the weightier matters of the faith? Today, I, th these are things I want you to focus on, especially during our, our, our time of response. Know that there will be people here who can pray with you about these. Uh, but I also want you to see the warning. The danger of irreversible apostasy. Most difficult passage in, in, in the Bible. In, in at least the book of Hebrews. Maybe all of the New Testament. Check this out. For it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift and have shared in the Holy Spirit and have tasted the goodness of the word and the powers of the age to come and then fallen away to restore them again to repentance. Why? Because they are once again crucifying the Son of God to their own harm and holding him up to contempt. For the land that has drunk the rain and often uh, falls on it and produces a crop is useful to those for whose sake it is cultivated, receives a blessing from God. But, verse 8, if it bears thorns and thistles, it is worthless and near to being cursed, and its end is to be burned. Do you hear the warning that the writer of Hebrews is right? He's like, hey, church, that's dull of hearing. If you cultivate good fruit, it's a blessing. But if you cultivate thorns and thistles, going to be burned, and it's going to be bad. I tell you, this is one of the most difficult passages in Hebrews because it sounds like uh, you could lose your salvation or something like that. There's actually four views, and we'll, we'll talk briefly about those. Um, but let me just go into this for, for, for sake of, of time. Here's the, the idea, that the reason it's difficult. Because it says it's impossible in verse 4, those who've fallen away in verse 6, to restore them again to Repentance. And the reason it's difficult is a couple of things, right? The, the first is it sounds like he's speaking to Christians. There's four participles that he uses. He says they're enlightened, they've tasted the heavenly gift, they've shared in the Holy Spirit, and they've tasted the goodness of the Word of God and the powers of the age to come. And so you get this people where the writer of Hebrews is looking at them and he's saying, man, if they're not Christians, I can't tell them apart from those that are. They look like they're part of the church. And you can go back and you can read really smart guys talk about this and there's, there's four views they come up with. Four views they come up with and, and, and all of them have different merits. They, they, these people that he's writing to, they, they look like Christians. What's the second half? The reason it's difficult is if they look like Christians and they leave Christ, 
Verse 6, those who have fallen away, it's impossible to restore them again to repentance. It sure sounds like he's saying, once you have tasted the heavenly gift, if you walk away, you can't come back. This is the difficulty. Four views come out of this. The views go like this. First, some people say they were saved and then lost. Others say they never were saved in the first place. They just look like believers. Third, they say it's a hypothetical uh, lost situation. The people are not really falling away as per verse 9, and we'll, we'll, we'll look at that. And then fourth is a view where it's falling away is a return to the law. Right? So it's not Christians losing their salvation. It's maybe Jews who are going back to the Old Testament and forsaking Jesus Christ. Am I, a couple of things I want you to get this morning is um, I would hold to probably the second or third view. They were either never Christians or it's just a hypothetical statement to, to get you to think about your, your, your salvation. Right? As, as much as... I would tell you, you absolutely cannot lose your salvation. God will persevere you to the end. And I would say that because Ephesians chapter 1 says, from the moment of your salvation, you are sealed with the Holy Spirit. In John chapter 10, Jesus says that nobody can take you out of my hand. Your salvation in Christ, I believe, is absolutely secure. But don't miss the warning. Church, don't miss the warning. In verses 7 and 8, there's this harsh warning about, like, if, verse 8, it bears thorns and thistles, it is worthless and near to being cursed, and its end is to be burned. Look, whatever view you might hold to in this most difficult passage, understand the warning is serious. And the idea of the warning, I think that, that, that the writer of Hebrews, he's trying to get these, 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 these listeners to understand this big point that we cannot, must not divide our trust between Christ's righteousness and things that cannot save us. Follow the, the, the progression. Right from, from, from the beginning, there's this confrontation. And the confrontation is these people who have not matured in spiritual things, but instead have relied on something else. And then you get to chapter 6, and the writer of Hebrews, he's like, hey, church, I'm begging you, don't divide your efforts between Jesus Christ and spiritual maturity and anything else that can't save you. Right, like have focus entirely on Christ and his grace. You know what that, that means for us this morning, friends, is that we shouldn't, we shouldn't sit out here thinking, I, I'm going I'm to work really hard that I could be saved. I'm going to work really hard that I could look better before Jesus Christ. I'm going to work really hard and I'm, I'm going to forget about the fundamental things of my faith and I'm going to forget about maturing spiritually. Instead, I'm going to carry my own weight of salvation. I'm going to make my Steve list. And my Steve list is going to have on it the things that Steve thinks I need to do that I could be acceptable before God. You know what? Take that Steve list and just tear it up. And go back to the Word of God and understand the basic things of the faith that Jesus Christ and only Jesus Christ and absolutely Jesus Christ and His grace is what brings us righteousness. This is where we go in our third point, the encouragement in judgment, we find grace. God pushes us forward to completion. Friends, I want you to, I want you to see in, in, in the text, right? As much as there's this harsh warning, check this out, verses 9 and following. Though we speak this way, yet in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things, things that belong to salvation. Isn't that glorious where he starts off and he's like, man babies make bad believers, and if you look like the vine that's full of thistles and thorns, you're going to burn. But in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things. Like I know you're going through a rough patch. I know your maturity is not where you want it to be in Jesus Christ. But I am sure that for you, Christian brother, beloved, 
We feel sure of better things, things that belong to salvation. Verse 10, because God is not unjust so as to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name and serving the saints as you still do. Right? They're still believers. They're just not mature. Verse 11, and we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness, to have the full assurance of hope until the end. Why? Verse 12, so that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Do you hear what the, the writer of, of Hebrews is, is getting at? He's, he's kind of hearkening back to this dull hearing. And he's using words like earnestness and sluggishness. And he's saying that the, the, the earnestness brings us this full assurance of hope until the end. And that we should not be sluggish or dull of hearing, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Listen, I, I know that, that some, of, some of our brothers and sisters, even in this room, are struggling with their faith and their maturity or lack thereof. But understand, you can have a full assurance of your hope until the end. As much as the warning is serious that those who have not received Christ, who have not trusted him, who only produce thorns and thistles, will for sure burn or be cast into the fire or be cut off, Jesus Christ has something better for you. He has for you hope of assurance. Get this. God offers us assurance of our salvation. God wants you to be sure of your salvation. God, God wants you to leave here this morning not thinking, oh man, my, my faith is hurting. I've not matured like I should have matured. And now, now because of my lack of maturity, I'm not even sure that I'm saved. Listen, God offers you assurance of salvation. And there's three points about the assurance of salvation. First, understand God perseveres us. I, I would also say God preserves you. But I want you to notice God doesn't just preserve you, but he perseveres you. In other words, God pushes you to the end of your faith. In verses 9 and 10, we see this. We see that, that, that the writer of Hebrews, he's like, hey, uh, I'm sure that God has better things in store for you, things of salvation. In other words, you're not going to fall away. You're not going to be that vine that never produces anything useful. God is going to produce in your life, brother, sister, he's going to produce good fruit. And it may not seem like that this morning, but in five years, if you look back, you're going to see in your life the way God has changed you. Next, understand that God uses godly examples to teach us. Don't, don't be sluggards. Don't be lazy. Don't be dull of hearing. But be imitators of those. Right? Imitators of those who have gone on before us. And if you continue in Hebrews, you get to the hall of faith in Hebrews chapter 11. And you see this great display of those who've gone before us that we can imitate and that we can watch. And listen, even today, look for somebody who's ahead of you in the faith that you can imitate what that man or that woman does. We talk about uh, Memorial Day and the, the heroes that have gone before us. Find a hero of the faith. Find, find, some, find somebody like, like Martin Luther or Dietrich Bonhoeffer or, 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 or just find a, a contemporary person, maybe your grandpa or your mom or your dad or your friend or the, the, the Sunday school teacher or, or maybe just the guy that nobody else knows but you know and you know that person's faith is strong. Imitate that person that you could learn from them. Learn from godly examples. And then get this, faith and patience secure us. As we grow in our faith, we start to find security. We start to find assurance of, 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 of our hope. Look, look at the way uh, verse 12 reads. Don't, don't be sluggards, but imitators of those who, how, how did those of faith, they, through, through faith and patience, they inherit the promises? Do, do you know that as our, our faith and our patience improve, we become more sure of our faith in Jesus Christ or our security in Jesus Christ? We, we, we know as our faith increases, as our patience increases, we, we know that nothing will separate us from the Lord Jesus Christ. I know that come hell or high water, Jesus Christ will push me to the end. 
I know that that when my parents die or my grandma or whenever the person I love dies, Jesus Christ is still Lord. He still sits on the throne. He will still make sure I get to the end. I know that whenever I don't know what else to do in my life, if I just remain patient in Christ Jesus, He will secure my faith and get me to the end. I know that even if I look at myself and I evaluate myself this morning and I say, God, help me. I am so far away from where I know I should be at this place in my life. God will secure me. Don't give up this morning because you think you're not where you need to be. Have patience and know that Jesus Christ will persevere you to the end of the race. This morning, as we come to our time of response, today ask God, very simple question. Right, God, what next steps do you want me to take in my spiritual journey? Think back as we talked about the list of places where you're spiritually immature or where you need to grow in your faith. Think back to where you were going through the excuses that you know you're making in your life, the daddy excuses or the mommy excuses or the spousal excuses or the whatever excuses are in your life. And today, right, lay that down and you come to Christ and and you just pray, God, God, I'm laying down my heart. I'm laying down my excuses. I'm laying down my life that I could grow in my faith in you. God, what's the step that I need to take next? God, today, do I need to be the guy that says, I I'm ready to teach a small group? Do I need to be the, the lady that says, I can disciple another lady and I can teach them what it means to remain faithful and patient to the very end? Today, am I the guy or the girl that needs to say, God, I need to be baptized for the very first time to show my faith to the world. Whatever that next step is you need to take in the faith, know that we are here to stand beside you as you take that faith. Please stand with me. We will pray together and respond as God leads us together. Father, God, we thank you for Jesus Christ. God, we thank you for the salvation that we share in him. God, I, I thank you that you confront us. Lord, I thank you that you confront me in my immaturity of faith. Lord, I thank you that you're here to help us remember that we've not arrived yet. God, I know it hurts when we do honest self-evaluation. But God, I also know that if this morning we would honestly evaluate our lives, that you would heal us, that you would help us, that you'd give us assurance of the hope that we have in Jesus Christ, that you'd persevere us to the end. Father, we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. As the music plays this morning, we are here to help you make those next steps. We are here to pray with you. Seek the Lord's will.